A very warm welcome indeed to Deliverance, and you're listening to the sound of Andrew J. Willis, our guest for the program. skillful trumpet playing of our guest for the program, Andrew J. Willis, and he's all the way from the States and comes to us for this edition of the program by way of a recording, courtesy of the Balamoney Church up there in beautiful County Antrim, and by kind permission of their pastor, Eddie Taylor. Now hold on to your hats because this is a real humdinger of a program. We always like to bring you something old, something new, something borrowed. And, well, not usually something blue. But anyhow, we're going to be a bit less comfortable than usual and bring you something to challenge you right down to your foundations. As in a few short moments, we join Andrew J. as he shares with us in both word and some real dynamic music. Well, personally, I can't wait, but then that's just me. By the way, I'm Wilbur Fitzgerald, if you don't already know it, your host for this and many other Deliverance programs, right here at this time each and every Sunday evening in the year, here on My Radio. What a blessing it is to us. You know, it's a real blessing to have your company, and I trust if you're not already, then you'll become part of our regular listening family to make a date with us here on the airwaves every week at this time. So come on, please don't let us down. So it's just about time for our guest to lead us onwards and upwards on the road of faith, Andrew J. Willis. And here he speaks to the congregation of the Balamani Church when he paid them a visit back there in 2002, the second visit that he has made to the north of the province here. And what a wonderful and stirring time all the folk there in the services had as they were challenged in their hearts by what Andrew had to bring with his own inimitable wit and very good humour. Well, Pastor Eddie Taylor, who introduced Andrew to the congregation, you may remember, hosted an interview with him on his previous visit to Northern Ireland, not long after September 11th. Pastor Willis, it's a joy to have you visiting with us in Ireland and sharing ministry in our churches here in Ireland, North Ireland. Uh, Perhaps you could tell us something about your early childhood, the family into which you were born. Pastor, thank you uh, for inviting us here to uh, North Ireland. Cheryl and I have had a great time here uh, among your people, warm and friendly folks that love the Lord, and it's been an exciting time for us. Uh, Of course, coming here wasn't my first exposure to being around fine Irish people. I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, and, um, and a lot of my friends when I was coming up were of Irish descent. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was actually raised in a pastor's home there on the south side of Chicago. And uh, so I had a lot of exposure coming up to ministry and uh, pastoring and being an evangelist and music. And all of that flows with what we do today. Traveling as you have most of your adult life in American churches, non Ireland, what differences would you see between the two churches in America and in Ireland? Well, uh, <laughs> Probably the uh, the first and most obvious thing are, are the cultural differences that really enrich the experience of being a part of the body of Christ. For example, in America, um, our praise and worship would probably tend to be a little louder, a little more demonstrative, just because that, that would be the American way. 
But mm -hmm. one of the en enriching things about the body of Christ is that wherever you go in the world and you gather with people who name the name of the Lord, you have an immediate camaraderie. And it's as if you've always been family, you just never met. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing that Cheryl and I have found particularly um, rich about worshiping here among your people is the depth of the worship. It's, it's not a shallow, superficial worship. It, it seems uh, to be in the services that we've been a true uh, heart approach to God and worship. Mm -hmm. It's a very moving experience. Yes. You traveled for quite a number of years in, as an evangelist. Now you're into church building as a pastor. Did you find the leap from inter-church evangelism to local church uh, building a big leap? Was it a big jump? It's, it's such a big leap that I'm still trying to make that <laughs> leap. I am, uh, how, how shall I say it? I am mid-leap as we speak. Um, as an evangelist, I really uh, had carefully considered that calling. Uh, you know, Paul encouraged a young preacher, Timothy, to do the work of an evangelist. Yes. And I think that it's truly a, a calling. The secular word might be uh, that, that it's an art. But the work that I've now begun as a pastor uh, shifts you from uh, the somewhat edgy, raw ministry of an evangelist to more of a careful um, shepherd, caring and focusing on individuals rather than just the corporate picture of a local church. You're looking at individuals who each have a world unto themselves, and they need somebody that cares about that and, and help them connect with God in their world. For them, it may be their family, maybe their marriage specifically, their children, their job, their career. And so they need a pastor that can care or shepherd them, is, is usually the way we describe that, and find out how I can help them connect with God in, in their life. We here in the United Kingdom, uh, Brother Willis, were saddened, hurt by the outrage, the attack on the New York Twin Towers. We found in our towns that there was tremendous empathy and sympathy uh, when that happened. It was a wave of revulsion. In America, do you think it has made the people focus more on God, the brevity of life, the, the, the fragility of our lives? You know, here today, gone tomorrow. Has it done anything like that in your country? Before I answer that, Pastor, let me firstly say a heartfelt thank you. From I, I have no official diplomatic status. I'm just a regular American citizen. Mm -hmm. But let me just say thank you from just a regular American citizen to you and to your people, to everybody in the United Kingdom that we have encountered on this trip that has been so kind that more than once Cheryl and I have been moved to tears on the street by the kindness of your people. In London, we saw where people were standing for hours to sign a book of condolence. Yes. Uh, then just a few days ago, I, when we were in the town of Coleraine, um, we, we saw another book of condolence in that town hall. Cheryl and I went in. The, in that little town, I don't know what the size is, but in that town, they have already collected over 4,000 signatures of people who just wanted to send uh, their kind condolences to us in America. So I thank you for that and for standing with us. Um, and and it, to answer now your question directly, it has had an amazing effect on America in a very short period of time. In a nation that has tried for, in, in my opinion, most of my young life, I'm, I'll be 34 years of age next month, uh, tried to wrest every last vestige of God consciousness from culture, from society, and even government. Right. In the last two weeks, or the last three weeks or so, since this uh, attack on the World Trade Center, um, everybody from the president uh, to the public utility workers have been crying out for God to help us in America. Now, while I do not subscribe to the idea that God was the architect behind this attack. There are some ministries in America, prolific ministries, that are suggesting this is the judgment of God. I do not subscribe to that. But I do believe that this could be a wake-up call for a nation on whom the hand of God has rested for generations and that has, if you will, wormed out from underneath that hand of blessing to stand on its own. And one of the things this has done is just as you articulated, it's reminded us that we cannot stand without God. And so for us, 
uh, in America, it has been a, a, um, a moving experience to see our president calling a nation to prayer. It's been a right. long time since we've seen that. That's right. And we've seen what have otherwise been deemed godless men, broken and asking for prayer. Men that, until this time, we weren't even sure they believed in God, asking us to cry out for God. So in that sense, this may do what preachers, <clears throat> churches, denominations have not been able to do. This has done in a moment of time. It has turned our attention towards the Creator. I, I, we have noticed in our newspapers, for, in, for instance, now last week, the, the, the headline in one was Apocalypse, you know, destruction, words that are frightening, somber words. And we find that our papers now talk about biological warfare, chemistry warfare. And it seems to us that this expression, the end of the world, is within the ambit of, 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 of human reasoning now. Secular writers talk like this now. Do you see anything here, God setting the stage, prophecy being fulfilled, taking us down the road where people are being forced now to focus on Bible prophecy, the end of the world, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ to rapture the church? I don't think there's any question about that. Um, churches have been full. It's been a long time since we've seen that in America. Yes. Uh, people are asking questions. People are buying Bibles. Bibles are coming off of the shelves mm -hmm. in places where they have not touched the stock of Bibles in years. They're removing Bibles and selling them by the dozens. I saw something the other day, Pastor, that I have never seen in my life, and I have crisscrossed America, preached in little towns and big cities, and I have never seen what I saw on the day of this tragedy in America. It was on a Tuesday, and during that one hour and a half drive, for the first time, and, and I want to underscore that, for the first time ever in my life, on a Tuesday night, as I drove to, to the to town an hour and a half away, I did not pass one empty church parking lot. Mm -hmm. Every church sanctuary had somebody in it. Now, they were not all jammed and packed to capacity, but every single one of those buildings had somebody in them. And... Uh, and of course, I, I went from periods of brokenness uh, and, and weeping uh, to praying as I was making the drive up and all the news was fresh to us. It was still developing. We were stunned for the first several hours. We, we were. Yes. And we didn't know what, what had happened, why it had happened, what was going to happen next. So I was still going through all of that. We were just, uh, you know, eight or 10 hours out from the, the first attack. And I saw all of those churches with people in every single one of them. And it dawned on me that finally my generation in America has had a shocking experience that says to them, all of our material gain means nothing to God and it means nothing to the devil. There is still wickedness in the world. There is still an enemy of men's souls. There is still demonic presence, mm -hmm. but there's still a God of heaven. And people are beginning to cry out to him and people, you, you know, on the national level, I said they're calling out for prayer. But, Pastor, on a personal level, there is no question that people are beginning to ask themselves, is it possible that the prophetic implications of Scripture could have some element of truth to them? And the reason I mentioned that on that first Tuesday night about churches being full, full is, is uh, in the subsequent three Sundays or so, however long it's been, churches are having crowds only seen in America during Christmas season. So uh, Bible studies are springing up in college dorms, um, in people's homes, in ante rooms of churches. Bible studies specifically about the prophecies to which you refer because people are awake now and mm -hmm. they want to know Same if here. the Bible said this is coming, what does the Bible say is coming next? I watched with keen interest the memorial service. I listened to Dr. Billy Graham. He, I thought he gave an excellent word. Beautiful emphasizing the fact that we were not now confronted with evil. It seemed to me in the past recent years that philosophers have tended to describe evil as a kind of the remnants of our, quote, animal ancestry, that with civilization we would progress and get rid of it all and evolve to a higher plane of living. It seems to me that what's happening in our world today is destroying all that notion, that man is intrinsically evil, apart from God, 
and that only a true faith in a living Lord Jesus Christ can enable man to overcome that evil part of his nature and do good to all men and to seek peace and pursue it as the Bible describes it. How do you view in America, is, would the Dr. Billy Graham view of evil become something that's becoming more common and prevalent in your country? That is a, a thought-provoking question. One's uh, esteem of, of Dr. Billy Graham after such a capable address under those circumstances where we're living in such uh, sensitive, politically correct times, Dr. Graham left no stone unturned yes. as to the message of the gospel. And uh, as a matter of fact, in my um, Americana style of having church, I was giving him loud amens <laughs> in, in my living room because in the face of others who did not endorse the message of Jesus Christ, he was there to say to America, to the world, to anybody who would hear it, that the message is man is born with the drive to sin, born with the ability to be evil. Uh, 51st Psalm says that, that I was born in sin, I was shapen in iniquity. David is not saying I am the Ill <clears throat> illegitimate son of an unwed mother. What he's saying is, I am born with a sin nature. Dr. Graham spelled that out in explicit terms. Yes. But the beauty of that was, he gave the answer. For America, for the world, again, for anybody who would listen. He said, we're not going to eliminate this by any method other than the cross of Jesus Christ. And of course, as an American, I think that there has to be a response. There will be a response. We support that as patriots. But, but there isn't a bomb, a gun a knife. There is no retribution or punishment that can be paid by the hands of man that will remedy the evil of our world. It's not going to fix whoever was behind this wicked attack. It will not rectify the wickedness that is yet to come. Only the cross of Christ does that. Yes. And, and uh, so there are reports just now, we, we're getting just reports beginning to trickle in of the legitimate conversions that are coming as a result of this. But, so I can't answer that question uh, with, with any real exactitude, but I will suggest that in the next few weeks and months, we're going to see things happen. We're instructing our people, take full advantage of this in your office, in your home, to get your Bible out and direct people to the prophecies and, and the indications of Scripture that, that say there is more of, of wickedness to come, but the answer and the hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. I have noticed in our own little country, perhaps in all parts of the United Kingdom, that people are becoming increasingly rich. Stocks and shares were flying. People were investing in what we call PEPs and ICES and unit trusts. And it seemed that the market was going up and up and up. We were becoming a, a nation of share owners. One outrage has taught us, I think, how fragile is our economy, that something like this can destroy our economy so that in building up monetarily and neglecting things that are spiritual is not the way forward. Man shall not live by I bread alone. alone. Yes. How do you feel on your side uh, of the Atlantic? Is it I, well, I concur way? with you. And I think the, 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 the prophecies to which you refer in the, the Scripture indicate that there is a storm coming. There's a storm coming yes. economically. There's a storm coming culturally. And I don't think that the United States, the United Kingdom, or any other people uh, are prepared for that, particularly in my generation. But if Scripture is to be believed, whether it's this storm or another, there is upheaval coming, the end of which can only be satisfied by the return of the Lord Jesus. And that's the message that people need to hear whether it's this time or the next time, there is, and, and see, you're so right. The, the affluency in America, in the Western world, the wealth of the Western world has murdered the move of God yes. because it has robbed us of our desperation for God. And, and while we're beginning to see a rebirthing of hunger for God, by and large, my generation knows nothing of desperation for God because we have never been desperate for immediate needs, we don't understand the need for God eternally. And, and, it, and these things are going to come to some great climatic uh, crescendo as we approach the return of the Lord Jesus. 
Bible scholars look into the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Revelation, see them not merely as seven local churches, but seven ages or periods of time, believing that we are now in what the Bible calls the Laodicean church age period. Jesus is depicted as standing outside the door, mm. knocking, asking for admission. A church that is rich, increased with goods, yet wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That seems to be the end of the age church that we now live through. In closing, what would be your message to that kind of a church that we're now living in? The message that is recorded to the what the old King James Version calls the angel of the church. Seven times he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And I think that's the message for the body right now. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. If you can't hear the earth itself, the Bible says that eventually that the earth will be groaning. For, for the coming of the Lord. If you can't see that and hear that in the things that are happening in nature, the things that are happening in our society, in our culture, hear what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit says that it's time. The Spirit says that God is trying to break into his own church, that he's trying to come back to fellowship with us, and that if we will draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. And, and that is, without question, that's where the church is at right now. We have need of nothing Physically, we have need of everything spiritually. And God signs the letter to Laodicea. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. What the Spirit is saying is that everything you have is meaningless in the scope of eternal time that has no end or beginning. Everything you need is in the God who rests in the eternal place. That's the message that people need to hear now, that what's happening in our world of time means nothing. What's happening in his world of timelessness means everything. We're nearing the end of the interview. It's been a pleasure and a joy and an honor to have you in our country visiting our churches. You've blessed them. You've challenged them. In our country, as in your country, there are different kinds of people, broken homes, broken lives, prodigal children, people fighting great battles in their personal lives. I wonder, in closing, would you be kind enough to pray with us that God will send revival to our country, a revival that will cut across, across all classes, cultures, and creeds, and lead families, men and women, boys and girls, to the sight of Jesus before the return of the Lord Jesus draws near. We would appreciate you praying for our country in closing. Shall we? Father, we turn our face towards you now. We humble ourselves in repentance. Jesus. We recognize that you are the creator of all mankind. Amen. We recognize that you have given us the gift of life. Thank Father, you. we ask you to forgive us because we have forgotten you. We have went on with our religious agenda many times in the face of godlessness without a consciousness of your presence or absence. And you told us through the words of the wise man that a nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. Father, some of us are living with that, not as a nation, but as a family, as a unit. We're living with the brokenness, the hell that comes from forgetting God. Yes. In the busyness of our lives, we have left you out. But I pray that you will come now to fill the hole that is left Amen. in all of our affluence in the Western world. Amen. We have so much, and we need so much. Jesus, Fill Lord. the hole that is left in our spirit that cannot be satisfied by having more. It can only be satisfied by the coming of God to our lives. As you do that, Father, would you be kind enough to touch families, marriages, moms and dads, Amen. sons and daughters, God and the granted. brokenness that is left from a life of sin. And as you do that, begin to seed national repentance and revival, international revival and repentance. We stand on the promise of your word. We know that you are waiting on our action because you already covenanted with us that if we will humble ourselves and call on you and turn from our wicked ways, 
you would forgive our sin and heal our land. Amen. We humbly request that you, sir, would heal our lands. The United States, the United Kingdom, the Western world, indeed, all of the peoples of the planet, that you would bring a revival to close out this age. God grant We it. submit it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Willis. God bless you in your ministry. Thank you for having us, Pastor. Do you have a little church left in you? Just a little bit. Come on, let's put our hands together and do this. This is old camp meeting song. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Yeah, he bathed my heart in love, and he wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. So let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our faintest cry And he'll answer by and by When you feel a little prayer, we'll turn it Lord, the fire is burning Just a little talk with Jesus makes it Call him up, tell him what you want. Oh, call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Woo! I wonder if anybody in this house remembers the night that thunder rocked the heavens, lightning and split the sky, and the shadowy figure of Jesus Christ emerged walking the murky waters of the Sea of Galilee. And he said to his disciples, it is I, be not afraid. Somebody needs to know that in the storm, it's good to have Jesus talk to you. And you need to go home tonight, kick the door, but on your house and tell the devil, I had a talk with Jesus. Oh, you don't hear what I'm talking about. Somebody needs to tell the devil, Jesus told me, it'll be all right. Well, he's certainly a bit different to what we're used to hearing on Deliverance, but that's what we're here for, to bring you a challenge to what you're used to, to what you think you know, to what you're comfortable in, and to what makes you stand still in life and in faith. We trust you won't be the same after you've been with us on this edition of the program, and of course, all the other ones that's coming along shortly. Don't forget you can enjoy Andrew and indeed any of our programs in their entirety, music and all, and best of all, without charge. How about that? By simply writing to us, using the details of our address, which are coming up in just a very short time. So as we always say, now is the accepted time, and now is the best time to reach for a pen and some paper. So let's join Andrew J. Willis once again, as he continues to bless and challenge our hearts in word and song. I'm really enjoying this, and I trust you are, right here on Deliverance. Somebody shout hallelujah. Isn't it great to be with God's people tonight? This is a day the Lord has made. Look at your neighbor and tell him God already did the hard work. Tell him he did the hard work. All you got to do is rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Pastor, for letting us come back to Balamone. And uh, 
I believe that we need a visitation of God in the world. In the last six months, God's been stirring my spirit to pray just that way. God, visit us in a way that we know we've been visited by God. In case you're not aware of it, let me help you out. My generation doesn't like church. They run from church buildings. They don't like religion. They don't like dead formality. My generation is, however, more desperate than any in the last hundred years to know God. My generation hates church. They despise religion. They have no sense of uh, commitment to the, the traditions and the rites of religion that many of us know. But in the last hundred years, there hasn't been a generation more hungry to know God. That's why there are so many, I'm sure it's in your country like it is in ours, there are psychic hotlines and there are so many people that are supposedly conversing with the dead. Do you understand why that is? It is not just that wickedness is more perverse than it's been, sure. But it would be too easy for us to excuse our inaccurate ability to impact my generation by saying it's just more wicked. I want to tell you that my generation is desperate to know God and they're looking for him everywhere else to see if they can find him. It's time for them to be able to show up at church and know before they leave this place, man, I touched God in that place tonight. I wonder if there's anybody in here that came on the chance you may be able to touch God before you get out of here tonight. Just wave your hand at me. Let me just see if I got anybody that came to seek him, to touch him. Father, breathe on us in this place tonight in a way that we will know we have heard from God. Talk to us. Talk to us to every gentleman, every lady, every young man and young lady in here that needs to hear from God. Each of us listening for you, talk to us in a way that we will know personally and individually we have heard from you in the name of Jesus oh God we need you to visit this nation we need you to visit every nation on the planet we need a visitation of the Holy Ghost we've worn out the whole religious ritual we've worn out the whole religious routine we're ready for God to show up in a way that it cannot be denied father sitting in this room tonight is somebody who came to examine the plausibility the possibility that God may be real but before they walk out of this room tonight, don't let the religious air, don't let anybody around them who has not in a long time commune with you, don't let it suffocate their desire for God, but arouse in them a hunger for God that will not be satisfied till they've touched you. God, I feel something in here tonight. I feel him in here. Matter of fact, why don't you just reach out and get a hold of the person on your right and left and help me pray for everybody in this room right now. Father, there are people in here that need a change tonight. They need you to break through on their life. They're not here tonight because they had to be. They're here tonight because they wanted to be. They're not here tonight because it was Sunday morning habit. They're here tonight because they're hungry for God. Oh, Father, I pray that you begin to turn around everything that the enemy has done to their family, what the enemy has done to their body, what the enemy has done to their mind, begin to turn it around and use it for your good, we do pray. Use it for your good, we do pray. In the name of Jesus. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Can't even walk without you holding my hand. It's a little something for the folks that thought the rest of it was too strong. This, is, this will be easy for you right here.
I just felt in my spirit all day that there are going to be people here tonight that are looking for God to turn things around for you. And he's going to do it. This is how he did it for me. Listen to this story. So I guess I'll give Jesus my all and all. From now on. I'd be less than a man Cause Lord I can't even walk Without you holding my Come on somebody help me sing that Lord I can't even yeah, Without you holding my hand Oh the mountain's too high And the valley's too about you, but I'm starting to get a little excited. I feel like God may have something special for us before we get out of here tonight, and that's the whole reason I came. It seems in our part of the world, there is every kind of excuse for why people in the pulpit are living lives as base as um, people not just in the pew, but outside of the church house. I'm still a little old school. I believe that when God calls you into ministry, when God arranges for you to be in leadership, if that's an usher, a Sunday school teacher, a nursery worker, there are certain demands placed on your life that you're called to live an exemplary life in front of people. Life gets tough sometimes. Life, maybe it doesn't at your house the way some of you are looking at me, but, or maybe you're still lying to everybody, but we just decided to tell the truth. It gets tough sometimes. Most of the time we don't, but we're stuck. Now we promise God. We live together till we die. Sometimes Cheryl pack her things, get in the car. I run outside in the driveway and stop her and I say, you promised God you wouldn't leave me till I die. She said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm coming back in there to kill you before I leave. I'm not leaving yet. <laughs> but when you make a commitment, when you make a vow, fruit is received after you live through the planting of the seed. The Bible says until it falls in the ground and dies, there's nothing to be received. But now we're coming into that time of life where we're thankful for what God's been doing and celebrated 14 years. I've got a family, a couple in my church has been married 52 years. Anybody here been married that long? 52 years? My Lord. 52, you married too young too. They have laws against that. I can see that now. <laughs> 52 years they were married. And I said, 52 years. I was preaching on marriage the other day and I had them stand up and everybody cheered for them. 52 years. I said, 52 years, man, we're just hoping to make it to 25 without anybody going to jail and we're going to be excited at our house. Brother, it hit me with a little something that I did last year in this church on a Sunday morning and apparently it had not been adequately communicated to me. It would not be a good Sunday morning song. And everybody was looking at me like I had more hair than anybody they've ever seen. And they couldn't believe a, a long-haired American evangelist would be singing such a song on Sunday morning. How many know it takes all kinds to put us in the fact? I mean, maybe your family isn't like this, but not everybody in my family is like me. Some of them are actually embarrassing types. And you can't take them anywhere, but they're still a part of the family. 
You know, that's how it is in the family of God. You don't have to like everything else everybody does. I'm going to be honest with you. I make a great evangelist because I don't like most of what everybody else does. So as an evangelist, I get to take everybody to task on that. Pastor, I learned a long time ago. My dad was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. I learned a long time ago that most preachers delight in preaching against the things they don't like. I preached for pastors that preached against playing golf. I found out they couldn't play golf. That's why they preached against it. And then I preached for guys that, I don't know if you play racquetball in this part of the world or not. Little little game, we little kind of a take on tennis. I, I, there were pastors that I found out they couldn't play racquetball. I found out the same thing can be true about music. Folks are against whatever they don't like. But you know what? One of the things that makes this a great church is you have so many young people here. And the reason that works is because you allow their expression. Everybody's got to give their own expression to it, to, to whatever it is. I don't like the music in most churches I go to. That's why I'm a pastor. I can have music the way I like to have music. I don't like most preaching. That's why I don't preach for everybody. I like Brother Taylor. But you know what? You don't have to send everybody else to hell if they're not doing it just the way you want them. I wish I could get some help anywhere in here tonight. It's a big world. And you embarrass some of the rest of us, but we put up with you anyway. So give us a little break. Let us be who the Lord made us to be. Just hit your neighbor and tell him you're all right anyway. I started on this journey not seeking wealth or fame the only thing I want in life is to bear his holy name I've had my share of problems and trials along the way but when the mountain gets too high this is how I pray I want to be a man after God's own heart I want to be a man after God's own heart I might stumble, I might fall But I'll get back up and hear the call To be a man after God's own heart me they criticize my ways but if they look inside my heart they'd find something good to say I'm not the one with the crown of thorns no nail scars in my hands I'm just the man with the real desire to be all that I can I want to after God's own heart, I won't be a man. After God's own heart, I might stumble, I might fall, but I'll get back up to hear the call. Be a man after God's own. Please open your Bible to the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis. I think last year when I was here on Sunday all day, I preached about um, Joseph the dreamer. I told a story about wanting to sing when I was growing up. M my two eldest brothers are extremely gifted and talented, and they're the real musicians and singers in the family. And, uh, th but then my chance came, and I kind of preached about that being the heel grabber, how Jacob held on to his brother's foot when he was coming out of his mother's belly. The implication of the text being, Jacob was saying, if, if you don't ap appreciate what you have, if you don't value it and you ever let go, I'm going to be waiting to get it. I want to encourage somebody here tonight, maybe a young person with that word, that feels like you don't have opportunity because somebody more gifted, more talented, with more flash is getting into a place that you'd like to be in. I want to tell you, hold on and be faithful. Because I'm not here tonight because I'm the most talented and gifted person. I'm not here tonight because I was supposed to be. I'm here tonight because the one who should have been, the one who could have been, the most talented people I know 
are the least successful people I know. I'm here tonight because the one who should have been, the one who could have been, laid it down and let it go. But I was holding on and I said, if they ever let it go, I'm going to snatch it up. I love to sing. I know I'm not a singer. I know what I sound like. My wife said, do you know what you look like when you're singing? I said, yes. She said, you look like you're in immense pain. <laughs> I said, you think it sounds bad. You ought to be creating that sound. It, it takes more work than it sounds like it does. Eighth of Genesis and the 22nd verse. I'm going to preach a we message tonight. They're laughing at me, Pastor. I've been here too many times already. They, they have me figured out. A we message. I'm taking that word back home to America. My Sunday morning folks will appreciate that. We uh, Americans are like goldfish. We grow to whatever size accommodation we are provided. <laughs> Genesis 8, 22nd verse. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. I, I'm just going to share a few thoughts, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with you tonight about the sign of a new season. Let's pray for just a minute before you're seated. Father, thank you for visiting this place tonight. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Some people can't go to church and have a good time. They're not, they're not rejoicing in their salvation, but we rejoice that we're not, we are not as we were. You have washed us with the blood of Jesus. Thank you we can rejoice that we're on our way to heaven. But for people in here tonight who need a change right now, I pray that you'd be kind enough to equip us to put in their hands the principles that will work for them to do so in Jesus' name. Now, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The blood is against you. Father, bind the strong man and loose the anointing of God. And here we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a man I might stumble, I might fall, but I'll get back up and hear the call to be a man after God's own heart. Some don't understand me, they criticize my ways. But if they'd look inside my heart They'd find something good to say I'm not the one with the crown of thorns No nail scars in my hand I'm Well, I'm sure I need to add very little to what our guest for the program by way of recording Andrew J. Willis has said Except to say that we always like to challenge your faith and the things you're used to here on Deliverance Please don't forget the things that you've heard as you've listened with us on this edition of the program. Remember, you can listen to them again on CD or tape by just simply writing to us. And if you're not too much all shook up, then we trust that you'll be our guest for our next program featuring the message that Andrew will be bringing us, the sign of a new season. And that will be here at the same time and on the same station. Our special thanks to Pastor Eddie Taylor of the Balamani Church up there in County Antrim for kindly granting us permission to use that recording from a Sunday service where Andrew was the guest singer and speaker. Now, just at this moment of our program, in case you didn't catch Andrew's prayers earlier, join him as he leads the congregation of the Balamani Church once again in prayer. Father, breathe on us in this place tonight in a way that we will know we have heard from God. Talk to us. Talk to us to every gentleman, every lady, every young man and young lady in here that needs to hear from God. Each of us listening for you, talk to us in a way that we will know personally and individually we have heard from you in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we need you to visit this nation. We need you to visit every nation on the planet. We need a visitation of the Holy Ghost. We've worn 
out the whole religious ritual. We've worn out the whole religious routine. We're ready for God to show up in a way that it cannot be denied. Father, sitting in this room tonight is somebody who came to examine the plausibility, the possibility that God may be real. Before they walk out of this room tonight, don't let the religious air, don't let anybody around them who has not in a long time commune with you, don't let it suffocate their desire for God, but arouse in them a hunger for God that will not be satisfied till they've touched you. God, I feel something in here tonight. I feel him in here. Matter of fact, why don't you just reach out and get a hold of the person on your right and left and help me pray for everybody in this room right now. Father, there are people in here that need a change tonight. They need you to break through on their life. They're not here tonight because they had to be. They're here tonight because they wanted to be. They're not here tonight because it was Sunday morning habit. They're here tonight because they're hungry for God. Oh, Father, I pray that you begin to turn around everything that the enemy has done to their family, what the enemy has done to their body, what the enemy has done to their mind, begin to turn it around and use it for your good, we do pray. Use it for your good, we do pray. In the name of Jesus. Everybody say in Jesus' name. I thought number one would always be me. I thought I could be what I want. On life's again, but Lord, I can't even walk without. Well, it certainly has been a mighty half hour or so with you here on this edition of Deliverance. We're just about all puffed out with the energy of Andrew J. Willis. We told you it was going to be a super program, so that's just what it's turned out to be. Please don't forget to write to encourage us, to let us know who you are, where you're listening from, and whether you're enjoying the program and what God has been doing in your life. And please don't forget the words brought by our guest by way of recording, Andrew J. Willis, as you move into this new week of faith and life among the people who you work and move among and love dearly. And so with our best wishes for the rest of today, until we have the pleasure of your company right here again on Deliverance, this is Wilbur Fitzgerald on behalf of all the Deliverance broadcasting team and our very special guest Andrew J. Willis saying goodbye to you and God bless you all wherever you are. Goodbye. And so, if you've been blessed and encouraged by the program or need special prayer, help or information, then our address to write to is as follows. Letters at deliveranceBroadcasting.org That's letters at deliveranceBroadcasting, all one word, dot org. And so on behalf of all my friends in the studio team, it's goodbye for now and God bless you all, wherever you are. Goodbye. Come on, somebody help me sing it. Lord, I can't even get without you holding my hand. Oh, the mountain's too high and the valley's too wide.